Welcome, I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Everyone is touched by psychiatric conditions, either themselves or a loved one. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Today on Healthy Minds. What could be more depressing to a child, more harmful than having a mother or father who's depressed? That's today on Healthy Minds. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, the New York State Psychiatric Association, and the New York State Office of Mental Health. Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Untreated depression is painful, not only for the person with depression, but for his or her loved ones. Today I speak with Dr. Myrna Weissman, a leading expert who has dedicated her life's work to the study of depression, specifically the impact of a mother's depression on the mental health of her children. Myrna, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to start off by asking you how you got involved in looking at depression and families. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question, Jeff. When I went through graduate school um, with four small children, and I had a job afterwards uh, doing my dissertation, studying depression, and studying depressed mothers. And I thought to myself, how could you ever take care of children and be depressed? And I began to wonder about this and wonder how it was transmitted, what happened to these families. And of course, by the time I finished school, I was into science, and I started a study in New Haven, Connecticut, in which I took depressed uh, parents, mothers and fathers, and I started studying their children. Well, 30 years later, I'm still doing it. <laughs> and we have followed now the children and the grandchildren. And we have some ideas about what happens to families. What type of things have you found over the years in the family members? Well, we found that depression runs in families. And that doesn't mean that everybody gets it. But if you have a depressed parent, the probability that the child will get depression is about threefold increased risk. Depression is very common in adolescents. The difference is that the adolescents who have a depressed parent go on to have a course over the years as they mature, which is with recurrences and problems in functioning, divorces, and other sorts of less favorable outcomes. So depression, while common and can happen to anybody, whether or not there's a family history, if there is a family history, then they have a higher risk of having a depression and also a higher risk of a, a poor course, a, poor, a more poor outcome over time, especially if they're not treated. Especially if they're not treated. Uh, depression is very common. Everybody gets depressed. Once it's sort of a signal that something's going wrong in your life. And it's, uh, it's extremely common in, in, the, in society. However, it's the ones who have family history where you have an outcome that can be less favorable and where you really want to make sure there's treatment and treatment early. Following these families for a long time, what's the effect of actually treating the depression of the mother for the children? We followed the children and then we followed the grandchildren. And I said, you know, what are we going to do to intervene and what could help? We knew that individual treatment would help, but how can we help the family? So I thought about it and said, well, you know, what could be more depressing to a child, more harmful than having a mother or father who's depressed? Because with depression, you don't have energy, uh, you feel hopeless, you have, you're not that interested, irritable, and that's not very good for children. 
I said, I wonder if we treated the parent if the child would get better. So we found a study that was going on, and the purpose of this study was to treat adults to get them into remission so that they were asymptomatic using different kinds of treatment, mostly medication, but they did have psychotherapy too. And we tagged along to this study, and independently of the treatment the parent was having, we studied the children. And we found, much to our pleasure, that if the parent got better, the child got better. By the way, that study was all mothers. The reason for that is that it was hard to get fathers into treatment. And because depression is less common in men than in women, but more important, fathers don't come for treatment as often. They may take substances to treat their depression or just ignore it. So they may suffer in silence or have on top of the depression substance misuse. And exactly. Abuse. Uh, we then followed the children after the mothers had been in remission for a year and we found the children stayed well. And we, uh, we also looked at the mothers who remitted later because some remitted within three months and others took longer than that. And we saw the same thing, that if the mother remitted at six months, the children got better at six months. Now, you may wonder, is this a Donna's study? You know, if you know the mother is better than you do, you just report the child is better. But in fact, we kept our team blind to what was going on with the mother. So you were studying the children separately oh, the from separate, the results yes. to make sure they were true results. Yes, and we didn't know uh, the mother's clinical state. So we were pretty pleased about that. Now, there have been other studies. This study was primarily medication. Uh, there's been another study that has used psychotherapy, a nine-month study done in Pittsburgh. They found the same thing. And then we did a second study, and that was uh, to see if there were any specific effects of different treatments. And what we found is that if the mother received a medication that produces irritability or energy that really can produce uh, irritability, that uh, the effect was less strong. So some medications that can have as an a side effect irritability, yeah. you want to avoid that kind of a side effect. Yes. Now that has to be replicated, as we say in science. But it was interesting. The mothers who were on the medications that were more calming said, I'm better able to listen to my child. And the children independently said, my mother was more loving and caring. The message there is that um, if a woman has depression and has children, the early treatment is better than later treatment, and that treatment can not only help her, but can help the children. The effect that you saw was just treating the mother without doing any intervention directly to the child, but through the mother it had a tremendous effect on the children. Exactly, and it makes common sense, doesn't it? Yes. In fact, after the study was published, my children made a t-shirt for me that said, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Great t-shirt. <laughs> Great, Great t-shirt. It's very true. Yes. Very true. Often we say a parent is as happy as their least happy child, yes. but the reverse is also true. Exactly. Now, what have you seen in the grandchildren over these years? Uh, we found that a grandchild that had two previous generations affected, that is the parent and the grandparent, uh, their course is uh, less good. They have very high rates of depression. The grandchildren we've been studying now are about 15 or 16, 17. They're, they're late adolescents. If there are two generations affected, then you begin to see very high rates of depression and anxiety very early. But even when it does occur, depression is, as you've mentioned, a treatable condition. It's a very treatable condition, very treatable with drugs, with psychotherapy. There are specific psychotherapies that have been developed just for depression. It's not psychotherapy forever. There are psychotherapies that are very targeted and can be brief. Uh, I think they should be available in primary care, where, that, where you see most of the early depressions. Often the physician that a person sees 
if they are depressed initially, is the primary care doctor. Um, it's crucial that they feel comfortable speaking about their depression, sharing it with the doctor, and then figuring out how to get treatment. The primary care doctors that we have spent time with actually done surveys um, where we find very high rates of depression in primary care. They're very astute about depression. They know about medications. They know how to elicit the symptoms. They know how to make a diagnosis for the most part. They don't have the time though to treat it. And what happens, at least in the places where we've studied, is that the patients get medication. And if you ask them um, what else they would like, they say they'd like to talk to somebody. You've been a part of a team that's developed a particular type of therapy. And I'd like you to speak about that. We've developed interpersonal psychotherapy. Um, there are two what we call evidence-based psychotherapies that have been developed for depression. There are others, but these are the two most popular. And one is cognitive therapy, uh, developed by Aaron Beck. And the other is interpersonal psychotherapy, which was developed by my late husband, Jerry Clareman, and myself. Cognitive therapy deals with uh, thinking. The person's helps person to, to think and restructure their way of thinking about the problem. It's very effective, widely used. Uh, interpersonal psychotherapy has a different strategy in which uh, the therapist tries to understand what was going on in the patient's life when the symptoms began in the here and now. So it doesn't go back to early childhood, reconstruct the past, deal with the transference. It deals with what are the problems that precipitated the episode, realizing that there, you know, there may be other underlying problems, but it tries to deal with that particular problem. And we've categorized it into four areas. One is grief, uh, loss of a significant other through death. The other is transitions, changes in your life, moving, divorce, new job, losing a job, even getting a new job moving into a new house and leaving the old house behind and the old family. The other are disputes. Those are the most common. Fighting, disagreeing with somebody who you love, who is important to you or at work. And the other are deficits, people who are lonely and have trouble establishing relationships. This is a brief treatment. It can be anywhere from five or six sessions, which we have done in one primary care setting, up until maybe four months. And there's been one maintenance study in which people were treated monthly for three years. And those were people who had serious recurrent depression, who had remitted, and the idea was to keep them in remission. There have been many different studies. There's been more study of cognitive therapy. It's more, I think, widely known. But interpersonal psychotherapy, I'd say, about is about um, the next one. And both of those are referred to as evidence-based, which means that there's research that has proven that it's effective and that it helps people. Well, it, there've been, there's been studies that are comparable to the studies you use to, to test medication. There's been, for IPT, we call interpersonal psychotherapy, there's been over 90 clinical trials uh, that have been used not just for depression but for different disorders. There's a study going to be published which summarizes those. And those are not just for depression but therefore other disorders, but mainly it's been tested in depression. And that's, I think, where it's most effective. If a person is experiencing depression and is seeking treatment and want to, in an, either instead of or along with medicine, want to have this type of therapy, IPT or cognitive behavioral therapy. How do they go about finding a therapist that can do that? That can be a problem. There are websites. Uh, cognitive therapy is probably better known, but I think there are websites and you just have to go on, on sites. There is an International Society of Interpersonal Psychotherapy it's open to anybody if you go on the website and say, I live in Peoria, is there an IPT therapist? Um, you will probably be able to find one, maybe not right in that town. And I think the same for CBT. Any major medical center should be uh, 
probably will have therapists that can do these treatments. Personal should ask their potential therapist if they have expertise in those areas, if that's what they're looking yes. to have as treatment. Yes, there's a, a very interesting report that just came out from the Institute of Medicine on developing a platform for evaluating psychotherapy. And this uh, report is, it's brand new, it's just being disseminated, but one of the things it's going to try to do is to see how these therapies can be better implemented, disseminated in training programs, made available, and also evaluated as to their cost and to their quality. There's no FDA for psychotherapy. And uh, although there are evidence-based psychotherapies, and IPT and CBT are not the only ones, I'd say there's probably about 11 or 12 that are, have been well studied. Um, it's sometimes very hard for the consumer to, to know where to find it, how to evaluate it, and know whether they have somebody who is trained. And hopefully this report is going to be able to develop standards. This is part of the Affordable Care Act. So it'll make it easier for people. But at this point, um, reaching out to an academic institution to try to get guidance um, or a website that specializes in one of these types of treatment is a way for somebody to find that kind of help. I think so. I can't think of a better way right now except asking around, but a website. And I know IPT has a website, and I'm sure that CBT has several websites. I want to ask you, uh, go back to the study. You've been doing it for 30 years. What's it like for you, um, not only as a, as a researcher and a clinician, um, but just as a person, to have followed people for that amount of time and see their family? Oh, it's fascinating. First of all, I'm very grateful to these families. Um, sometimes we hear from them. Uh, I don't do the interviewing, so I don't have the direct personal contact um, on, a, on a regular basis. And right now, we're, we're not doing any interviewing. But I'm extraordinarily grateful. I feel like I know them. And occasionally, they'll call and ask for help. And we feel quite committed to trying to provide that help if not ourselves, because they don't live here. They live all over the country now uh, to make sure that we can get them connected to a place that can provide help. But um, it's a privilege to have been able to do that. You know, we, we also have done other studies I haven't talked about because we're, they're novel. We have studied MRI studies, magnetic resonance, uh, studies. We've done EEG studies. We're trying to understand some of the biological mechanisms that explain why people are at risk. This is at a very beginning stage. What do you expect those kind of studies will, will end up showing? It's because the fields are changing so rapidly. And, you know, the neural networks, we thought that we would just look at the structure of the brain and we would find cortical thinning, and that would give us an explanation, a biomarker. And we learned that there's different ways now of looking at the brain imaging and quest different questions to ask. So we can make clinical predictions, but we don't understand the mechanisms. We've also done genetic studies. Again, there's new techniques that, uh, like exome sequencing that weren't available when we started. They weren't even a dream when we started. So we hope that these data will be, they're all de-identified and we hope. Which means that it the name of the person, the family is. The name, the there. address, the birth date, everything is off of it. It's anonymous. And that we hope someday that as our tools get more sophisticated, we'll be able to identify biomarkers that will tell us in a personal way, uh, who's at risk. Right now, we can tell in a personal way based on clinical. And those are odds. We can't say this individual is going to get a, a, a bad clinical course. But what we can say is that the probability that this person might have a, a bad course or a good course is a certain percent. 
So it's not quite personalized. It's about risk. But knowing that risk can help identify methods of treatment so as to shift the risk away from a negative outcome to a positive outcome. Yes, if I, if I saw an, an, a, a, a child with a family history of depression who had an onset prepubertally, you know, before they reach puberty, um, I would pay more attention to that and I wouldn't consider it just childhood angst. And that doesn't necessarily mean that child's going to have a bad outcome. It's just that the risk is higher. A couple of take-home messages. One is for a parent who's depressed, they should seek treatment and that benefits themselves and just as importantly, their children. And the other is as a parent, if they see in their teenage child signs of depression, signs of anxiety, they should seek professional help for that child. If, especially if they have a family especially history. Especially the family history. Yes. And the other is they shouldn't blame themselves. A depression is an illness. You don't blame yourself for having hypertension. You may modify your diet, and the same in depression. You may try to figure out what's stressful in your life that you might handle differently, but it's not your fault. One of the symptoms of depression is to blame oneself and be critical of oneself. So I think that's a very important. Nobody wants to be depressed. Nobody decides to be depressed. And just as with other illnesses, it occurs not due to somebody's weakness. That's right. And for the family member who's living with a depressed person, and it's not so easy, <laughs> um, the message isn't shake, get out, just get yourself out of it. But it but the message should be, what is it that's going on in your life now that's making these symptoms happen? What is it that's troubling you? That, sometimes that can help in and of itself. If you have somebody who's pretty well functioning, but they've had something stressful, um, trying to pinpoint those symptoms to something going on in their immediate life can be very eye-opening and sometimes can help them unravel the problem. Right. Sometimes it becomes a snowball effect where there's some stressor in life, the person begins to get depressed which makes it harder for them to cope with that stressor yes. and there's a snowball. If you break that cycle and identify what steps they can take to deal with the stress, that can help relieve the depression. Yes, exactly. Um, but telling them to just shake themselves out of it doesn't help. That, that would just be makes like them... telling a person with a heart attack to shake yourself out of it. Yeah, that just makes them feel more guilty. On the other hand, trying to identify what's going on, what's changed? What's, what's new in your life that's been hard? And it's sometimes amazing, very intelligent people with a lot of insight don't pick up that they're starting to, they're feeling badly and what's happened is they've been fighting with their teenage daughter or they're changed their job and they don't feel so good about it. Um, or they're worried about their spouse's illness and they don't make those connections, which sometimes to other people seem so obvious. So it isn't just looking and saying, well, anybody in that situation would feel that way, but it's helping the person to identify the beginning of the symptoms with that problem that ero erupted in their life, which may be obvious to everybody else but that person. Right, and that person, if it happened to a friend of theirs, they would realize it for the friend, yes. but not for themselves. Exactly, and uh, and because the depression sort of clouds one's awareness, and this, this sort of a strategy for some people can produce mastery. You know that, oh, of course, I started feeling that way when my husband became ill and I'm worried about him. That's not the end, but it's the beginning and at least there's a problem there that might be dealt with. Myrna, thank you so much for your research, for your ongoing work to help people, and thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Dr. Weissman's research has spanned more than three decades 
with discoveries that help us better understand the biology of depression and a way to help prevent depression for the next generation. If you are experiencing a clinical depression, do not suffer in silence. Depression is a treatable condition. Remember, with help, there is hope. Until next time, I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Goodbye. With help, there is hope. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, the New York State Psychiatric Association, and the New York State Office of Mental Health.